welcome to Easter at Willow. Would you stand up on your feet and join us as we sing to the risen King? Come on. Do you see what I see? just turn to somebody near you, welcome them to Willow, tell them happy Easter, and then you can have a seat. (laughs) 
Well, if I have not had the opportunity to personally meet you yet, my name is Sean. I have the opportunity to serve here as the campus pastor here at Willow Creek, South Barrington. It is great to have you with us this Easter morning. Now, whether you've been here for 40 plus years or whether this is your very first time, our hope would be that you find this community to be a place that is warm, that is welcoming, a place where you can find long, uh, belonging. I hope this is a place that you can ask tough spiritual questions and ultimately a place that you can connect to God in a real way and connect to others in a really life-changing way as well. So no matter where your journey has been, we're just glad that you're here. Grateful to have you. Uh, if you, When you walked in, hopefully you got a handout that looks something like this. Uh, this handout's gonna give you a lot of different information about things that are going on around here and how you can take steps and, and connect to all the good things that God is doing around here at Willow Creek. I do wanna highlight one thing that's on here. On the back, you're gonna see something called Rooted. Rooted is this 10-week spiritual experience that I would say is becoming like the most important first step in somebody's spiritual journey around here at Willow. So if you've not yet been a part of Rooted, even if this is your very first weekend at Willow, I would love for you to consider joining us for this 10-week study. It, it, will, it will be one that will connect you to people. It will be one that will be life-changing in your own journey. So we're kicking off Rooted again in just a couple of weeks. You can learn more by going to willowcreek.org slash rooted. Now, it's Easter morning, right? And uh, for literally hundreds and hundreds of years, there has been this tradition, this faith Christian tradition that, that many times somebody who's a part of a priesthood or clergy, some religious leader, will say this phrase, he is risen, and then people will respond, he is risen indeed. you've heard this before, he is risen indeed. So let's try this. I'm going to say he is risen. You just respond with everything in you, he has risen indeed. So here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's why we're here to celebrate that Jesus Christ has, in fact, rose from the dead. I mean, what if that's true? What if that's actually true? It would change everything. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's roughly about a mile to the east from here. And once he was arrested, uh, the religious leaders, they, they brought him to Caiaphas Palace. It's where he would have stood the first of a series of trials that he would endure that particular night. As he met in front of the Jewish religious leaders, there were all kinds of illegal things they did according to their own religious rules. According to their own law, they couldn't arrest a prisoner on a bribe. Uh, they couldn't hold a trial at night. They couldn't hold a trial during uh, a Passover season. I mean, truly, it's one of uh, many, you could say, dozen illegal things that were happening in this season. I mean, it truly was no trial. It was a travesty of justice. But after meeting with the high priest and forming the Sanhedrin together, the Sanhedrin kind of functioned like a Supreme Court. It was a, it was a governing body and they rubber stamped their decision. They, they wanted to execute Jesus. They sentenced him to be crucified. The challenge was they didn't have the power to execute a prisoner. You see, the Jews weren't in charge. Instead, the Romans were still in charge at the time and they weren't allowed to, to crucify a prisoner without the Romans giving the permission to do so. And so he was eventually sent from Caiaphas' palace to Herod's palace. Today, in today's term, Herod's palace is no longer standing, but as tradition holds, Herod's palace would have been in this area. And as Jesus went to Herod's palace, he stood trial in front of the Roman governing authorities, in front of a guy named Pilate, then to Herod himself, and then back to Pilate. It was a whole series of trials that many times, uh, Pilate actually tried to release Jesus, but eventually tried to appeal to the pity of the crowd. And so he had Jesus beaten up by these Roman soldiers that had been trained to use their fists as weapons. He eventually sentenced Jesus to be flogged, which was this horrific, horrific uh, season of torture. Uh, Jesus would have been beaten up so badly, he, he would have been unrecognizable, probably hardly able to stand. Uh, what we know now is many times prisoners didn't even make it to a cross because they died during the flogging. It was so severe. But nevertheless, uh, what the Romans decided to do was to crucify Jesus. 
As they put this purple robe on him, they eventually fashioned a crown of thorns. They put it on his head to mock him as a king, and they sentenced him to be crucified. How did the Father's love for us? How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to me. Jesus was forced to make a walk from the trials ultimately to the place that he was crucified. And that journey is now marked right here in the old city of Jerusalem and it's called the, the Via Della Rosa. It's basically the, the road of sorrow. That journey starts right here at this particular church and, and meanders through the city, ultimately the place where Jesus was crucified. And, and on this journey, this Via Della Rosa, there are moments to stop and reflect 14 different stations. Many faith traditions call them the, the stations of the cross. And though the Via Della Rosa now in the modern day times are full of shops and different souvenir places and restaurants, there are all kinds of moments to stop and reflect of all the things that Jesus experienced on this road. For example, moments like uh, Jesus was forced to carry the cross beam of the cross, the Via Della Rosa. It's a beautiful journey, a reflective journey of the very difficult journey of sorrow that Jesus took. While walking the Via Della Rosa, there's a small section of road, the road that I'm standing on right now, where there were some stones that were found in an archeological dig some three meters below where I'm standing. These stones were brought to the surface, but the significance of these stones is they date back to the time period that Jesus was alive walking the city. So if in fact we are standing on the true Via Della Rosa, it's very possible that Jesus literally walked on these stones. This is the spot on the Via Della Rosa. They commemorate the moment where Jesus buckled under the weight of the crossbeam of the cross he was carrying. Most scholars think that that crossbeam weighed about 75 pounds and it's not surprising that Jesus' body buckled because he'd been tortured physically so horribly the night before that his body just couldn't take it. It was at that moment that uh, they pulled a guy out of the crowd, a guy by the name of Simon of Cyrene, and he was the one that carried the cross the rest of the way. But if you look just a little bit further down, you'll see a place that as tradition holds is the place that Jesus put his hand to brace his fall. And pilgrims over hundreds of years have placed their hand in this same spot, kind of making a greater indention to the wall. But it was a moment on the Via Della Rosa. Scripture tells us that Jesus was crucified on a mountain that they called Golgotha, which literally means the place of the skull. Now, it could have been called that because a lot of people were executed here, so there's a lot of death and skulls, or it could have been that because some suggest that the mountain shape was shaped, if you use your imagination, it looked a little bit like a skull. Now, there's a couple of places that people think could have been Golgotha. One's about a third of the mile north of here. The other is actually right behind me. Tradition holds that this building that's now known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre now houses the site where Jesus was crucified 
and eventually buried nearby. If you were to go inside the church, the sepulcher, you will find the place that potentially he was, he was pinned to that tree. If you think about the moment of the cross, there was a charge that was placed on the top of the cross that simply read, Jesus, King of the Jews. It wasn't really a charge, it was just the truth. But it was here. It was here that Jesus was, was pinned with the arms stretched out, and that his, his arms were stretched out for his love for you and me. I mean, it's here. It was here that Jesus took on the sin of all humanity. You see, the divine pair had a deal, and Jesus was held personally responsible for every sin that had ever been committed of all time. In many ways, it was here that Jesus put death to death. Death to your addiction, death to the sorrow and pain, death to hardship and hurting. He put death to death so that one day we'd be able to experience new life, in a sense, a resurrection. It's kind of surreal to be here. The place where God did his single greatest work in all of human history, for my life and for your life. I mean, what if it's true? I mean, what if it's true that the end of the Via Della Rosa, at the end of the road of sorrow, death was put to death so that you and I could experience hope and new life? You know, Scripture records that when Jesus was crucified, there was this war-hardened Roman centurion that said, surely this is the Son of God. What if? What if that's actually true? What if you and I also made the same declaration that surely he is the Son of God? perfect Son of God in all His innocence and walking in the dirt with you and me He knows what living is He's acquainted with your grief 
man of sorrow and son of suffering, blood and tears. How can it be? Is a God who weeps? Is a God who bleeds? Oh, pray. Disciples watched as their teacher, their Lord, their friend, the man they'd given everything up in order to follow, was laid into a tomb. A rock was rolled in front of the entrance of the tomb, burying their hopes right along with the body of Jesus. 
that that rock was immensely heavy. It was, it was guarded by Roman guards. They, they took their place to keep watch over the grave. I, I can just imagine the disciples asking themselves, well, now what? The people who had been following Jesus, some of them healed by Jesus, some of them uh, who had been cast aside by their society had been looked upon by Jesus with compassion and dignity, and yet now he's gone. I'm sure they're asking themselves, now what? I mean, yes, Jesus had prophesied about rising from the dead, but that, that, that just didn't happen every day. Like, that wasn't normal. And so what you see is the normal human response. Doubt, questioning. You know, it's interesting. People have asked me from time to time, do you, you, you say you believe, do you really believe what the Bible says about this? Do you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? And if I'm being honest, <laughs> over the course of my life, my faith journey, yeah, I've had questions. I've had doubt. I think it's natural to ask big questions. But, but I'd like to ask another question. What if it's true? What if it's actually true that Jesus rose from the dead? Now, listen, I don't pretend to have answers to every question, but as I've wrestled through my own doubts, my own process, my own questions, some of the things that I see in Scripture have really helped to solidify my conviction that Jesus is who he says he is and, and really did die for the sins of the world and rise from the dead. Look at what the disciples did after they encountered the resurrected body of Christ. Scripture tells us initially that James, the half-brother of Jesus, that, that he'd once doubted Jesus, didn't believe that he was the Messiah. Scripture also tells us that there was another, um, another disciple, Thomas, who we often refer to as Doubting Thomas, that, that he didn't believe that Jesus had resurrected from the dead right away. And we all kind of get on him about that. But if we're honest, why should he? Why, why should they have believed that Jesus is who he said he was? I mean, people don't come back from the dead every day. But look what happens. The tomb door was not opened by human hands, heavily guarded by armed soldiers, sealed with a stone. No single person could have moved that stone. No, the resurrection power of God is what rolled the stone away. I mean, listen. If Rome had wanted to stop this Christian movement, if Rome wanted to prove that, that they'd won and that Christians had lost, all they had to do was show the body of Christ, the body that was in this tomb, the body that was under guard. All they had to do was present, present it as proof that he did not rise from the dead, but they couldn't. They couldn't present the body because there was no body to present. Jesus had risen from the dead. And, and we're told that Jesus didn't just appear to his closest friends, that, that it wasn't just some cleverly devised story of the disciples kind of leaning in together and saying, all right, here's what we're gonna tell people. And no, in fact, it says in scripture that Jesus not only rose from the dead, but that he showed himself to over 500 people at once, 500 eyewitness accounts. And we're also told that Jesus revealed himself to those disciples, to, to Thomas, the disciple who doubted, he invited Thomas to touch his nail-scarred hands. In fact, church history goes on to tell us that, that Thomas went on to, to India to minister to people, telling them about the resurrected Jesus for the next 40 years of his life. Now, eventually, Thomas is captured, he's tortured, and he was told to either deny Jesus' resurrection or be executed himself. And do you know he chose death? In fact, all of those disciples, all but one of the disciples were martyred for their testimonies. Uh, those guys didn't die for a lie. And emboldened by the conviction of their eyewitness account of Jesus, those guys went throughout the world telling people the good news, the gospel, that Jesus rose from the dead. And I am so glad they did because my life, my life is forever changed by the truth that Jesus died. And then three days later, he rose from the dead.
that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we
Have a seat. Happy Easter, everybody. One writer referred to Jesus this way. More than 2,000 years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. Never owned a home. He never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives, they were inconspicuous. In infancy, though he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled legal experts. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature and he hushed the seas to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine, and he made no charge for his service. He never wrote a book. He never went to college. And yet all the libraries of the world could not hold the books that have been written about this man. He never wrote a song. And yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never practiced psychiatry, and yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. The names of past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and they've gone. The names of past scientists and philosophers and theologians, they have come and they have gone. But the name of this man abounds more and more. And though time has spread 2,000 years between people of this generation and the scene of his crucifixion, they still call his name because he is risen and he is risen indeed and his name is Do you believe that today? If you believe that, give God glory today. If you believe that, do you believe that? You know, we've been asking the question, what if it's true? And that's a really important question. I mean, if Jesus wasn't the Son of God, if he didn't rise from the dead, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, that if the resurrection didn't happen, then our preaching is useless. Your faith is worthless. Like, what he's saying is, it all hinges on a historical event, the resurrection, that, that Jesus didn't come to teach us just how to love our neighbor a little bit better or to make sure to take care of the poor. He didn't give you principles through which to, to live a little better life. He did all of those things. But all of that hinges on a historical event, the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Whether or not it's true is a very important question. It's just not the most important question because it could be true over here and you not engage with it in any way. And so we just asked in that last moment of reflection another question, which is a really important question, and that is the question, do you believe that it's true? And that's a really important question, too. Um, It was the summer after my first year in seminary, and my dad worked for an insurance company, and so he got me a cushy job inspecting houses over the summer, which sounds like a really boring job, except for the fact that it started with training on how to battle dogs in the field. And I can't tell you how many times I've run back to my car, how many times I used my measuring stick as a a, a way to fend off dogs. In fact, one time I went to a farmhouse and a bull chased me back to my car, no lie. And I worked for State Farm, so my shirt was bright red. The bull did not like me at all. That summer, I worked with uh, my manager. He was a manager, and we would ride together in the car a couple of days a week. We had lots of time to talk, and when he found out that I had gone to seminary, I was, headed to, I was going to seminary, he had all kinds of questions. He, he asked me some of the questions that you've probably asked, that I've asked myself in moments of doubt. He, he asked me that question, um, if God is 
all powerful. He's all powerful, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, if he's all powerful and he's all good, you believe he's all good? Yeah, I believe he's all good. So if he's all powerful and he's all good, then explain to me why all this bad stuff happens to even really good people. And he asked me that question about the Bible. He said, hold on a second. You, you realize, Dave, that the, the Bible was written by like a lot of people, imperfect people, to, to, to according to your beliefs, Dave, like sinful people, like all these imperfect people, and over the course of hundreds of years, dozens and dozens of people writing the Bible. You believe that? Well, yeah, I believe that. And, and then, Dave, once it was written, it was given to hundreds of people to copy, to make copies. They didn't have the printing press. They didn't have the digital. And so the only way that, that it got copied was it got given to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of imperfect, sinful people that make mistakes. And so, Dave, my question for you is, do you really believe that you can trust the Bible? And it was my first year of seminary. So the, the way it would happen is he would ask me these questions and I would go, hold on. And then I would run home and I would open up my books and look at my notes and I'd call professors and I would try to have this conversation with him and answer all the questions that he had. And, 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 and we would go back and forth and it was a great summer. And at the end of the summer, um, I had one sort of car ride left with this guy. And so I got really bold and I just said, hey, you know, where are you at with all this stuff? Like we've been talking about this. We've been going back and forth. We've been answering questions, asking questions. Where are you at with all this stuff? And folks, I want to tell you, he was in our Easter choir today. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. I, I, I want to tell you that, but that's not true. I, I would love to be able to end the story that way, but... <laughs> Somebody's like, we're going to a different church next year. This is not, <laughs> not right. Now, you know what he said to me? It was really interesting. He said, Dave, I think I believe in God. I'm like, okay, I'm leaning in. He said, I, I think I believe Jesus is the son of God. I'm like, okay. He said, and honestly, I, I think he rose from the dead. And I'm like, okay. And then he said this. He said, and, and honestly, Dave, I, I probably, if I died tonight, I probably wouldn't make it to heaven. He said, but I'm just having so much fun in my life right now. I'm not really ready to make any change. And that's kind of where we left it. And, and that's served as an example to me that the question, do you believe it? That's a really important question. That the question, is it true? That's a really important question. But it left me understanding that, that you can believe and still not make a decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In fact, I don't know how many Easter's you've been to, how many times you've heard the story. I don't know if maybe some of you even grew up in church and you kind of understood that Easter's you know, it's not really bunnies and eggs, it's, it's Jesus and all that. I don't know how many times you've heard that, but I think there's a danger for those of us that have grown up knowing the story, who have come to a lot of Easter's, I think there's a danger for some of us to go, uh, do I believe it? Well, yeah, I believe it, but that's it. I think there's a danger for some of us who maybe have come to an Easter service before and even gotten emotional in the midst of the story. Wow, somebody dying on a cross and that makes me emotional and I hear the music and it makes me emotional. And, and, and when someone asks you, do you believe? You go, well, yeah, got, yeah, I believe. Are you a Christian? Well, yeah, my, my, my mother was a Christian. I go to church on Easter. I mean, I, I, of course. Do you know that Jesus said these words that haunt me? He said there will be people that call him Lord. Sort of like with their mouth, they say, Lord, Lord. And yet, they don't know him. And I think what he's getting at is that there is this difference between saying, I believe in Jesus, or even I believe in the resurrection, and this decision, or this moment, or this trusting Jesus, to put my faith in Jesus as my personal Lord 
and Savior. He is my leader, and I want him to forgive my sins. That there's a moment of faith that that's different than just believing. Blondin's greatest fame came on September 14th, 1860, when he became the first person to cross a tightrope stretched 11,000 feet. It's over a quarter mile across Niagara Falls. People from Canada came, people from America came. They all went to the shores. They watched this guy do an amazing feat. He tightrope walked across Niagara Falls. It was amazing. When he was done, everybody applauded. It was amazing. He then took it up a notch. He put stilts on and walked across a tightrope. When he was done, people lost their mind. He said, but wait. He put a blindfold on, went across. People went crazy. At one point, he took a little oven out on the the tightrope, made an omelet, and ate it, and then came back. I'm telling you, people lost their mind. He then took a wheelbarrow, filled it full of uh, sacks of potatoes until it weighed as much as a man. He said, this weighs as much as a full-grown man. How many of you believe? that I can walk across this tightrope. And of course, at this point, everybody's just like, we believe, we believe. And he's like, yes. And so he does it back and back. And then he took the potatoes out and he said, how many of you believe that I could put a full grown man in this wheelbarrow and wheel them out across this tightrope? And people by this point are in a frenzy. They're like, we believe, Blondie, we believe. And he said, which one of you? will be that man. And you know no one put their faith in Blondin. There's just a difference between believing and placing your trust in someone. And I guess what I would say, and forgive me for this, but have you jumped in the wheelbarrow of Jesus Has there been a moment in your life when you made a decision to say, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior? Because folks, let me tell you, it is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I've got four kids, and I love you guys, but I wouldn't give up one of my kids for you. You, if, you're a, if you're a parent, you probably feel the same way. God looked at his one and only son and said, I love them so much. He gave his one and only son who died on a cross, three days later rose from the dead. And he says, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son and whoever believes, places their trust in Jesus, will not perish but have everlasting Life. It is a promise of heaven, but it is it is a promise that the results and the consequences of sin, which is death, that 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 sin and the ultimate consequence of sin, death, would not would not win. Sin is not just a church word. It's the choice that we make that goes against God's will. It it is the choice that we make or that someone else makes. And, and, And sometimes the pain that we feel, in fact, I would tell you this, I think most of the pain that you have ever felt in your life is as a result of this fallenness in the world, this idea that that someone else has made a poor choice or that maybe even you or I have made a poor choice. And if I think about my life, a lot of the pain that I've experienced is because of a choice I made or a choice someone else made or the fact that we live in a broken world, and Jesus comes to that same world and says, I will live in it. I will understand what you're going through because I will live and go through the same, and then I will experience death, the the, the result of all that sin and all that brokenness, but I will not stay dead. I will conquer death three days later, and then he extends an invitation to you and to me to say, if you place your faith in me, then your sins can be forgiven. You can overcome death as well. And that's the good news. 
And in just a minute, we're going to give you the opportunity to come. If you've never said yes to Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity to come and to make that decision. There'll be people up front. They can talk through you, uh, talk through that decision with you, answer questions for you, help you in any way. If you want to pray with somebody, there'll be people up front. But I want to ask you, if you've never made that decision today, what better day? Easter Sunday, 2023, this is your day. You say, well, I'm up in the balcony. That's okay. We'll wait. You could walk all the way down. These people will wait for you. We're going to sing a couple songs. And while we do, there'll be people that will come forward. They'll be praying for you, praying with you. We'll be praying for you. There'll also be people that will be baptized today. When you see this happen, people going down into the water, this symbolism in the New Testament, first of all, like Willow didn't come up with it. This was a New Testament deal where they went down into the water as an external, an outward expression of the faith in their hearts. We'll be celebrating those today as well. And if you've never seen a baptism before, we just want to encourage you. Today could be your day. Next week, we're going to be doing baptisms as well. And we put together a little story, uh, Megan's story, to show you what it's all about. Take a look. I definitely felt tugged by the Holy Spirit to connect about 10 years ago. I felt pulled toward Christ as a model of sacrifice and loving discipline, humility, and purity of spirit. I believe in baptism, and I wanted to demonstrate the seriousness of my faith and share that in a public way. I wanted to show my children that life is about learning and growing and following your best path at any age. I was raised without faith of any kind, and I came to faith on my own as an adult. I wanted to receive baptism so I could more closely join with God in my heart and soul and in my daily life. I am grateful to Willow for creating this opportunity for my family and I and for helping us celebrate it in such a loving and supportive community way. So from the bottom of our heart, we thank you uh, to the Willow Creek community. Yeah, give it up. So as we sing this next song, I want to encourage you, we'll stand up. If you want to take a next step with God, there'll be people up front that can help you do that. Um, perhaps your next step is uh, one of the things that I already shared with you. Maybe for you, it's just to come back next week to bring a friend, to love your neighbor the way Jesus taught us to love our neighbor. Um, maybe for you, it's uh, generosity and giving. We'll have our uh, ushers come forward during this song. If you'd like to make a gift to support the ministry of this place, first of all, thank you, and God bless you for that. Let's stand together and take our next steps with God.
sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. Can you sing that with me? We sing hallelujah, we sing, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. God, we celebrate your, your goodness, your greatness. Fathers, we just pause and reflect on the events of Good Friday and Easter. God, we're overwhelmed by your generous gift of love and grace to us. But Father, I just ask, as we encounter your, your presence, the resurrected Jesus, God, we would, we would not leave unchanged. God, move in us, work in us, change us. God, we give it all to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Church, it was so good to be with you here on Easter together. Our, our pastoral response team will still be up front for as long as needed. So uh, here's the truth. Like, we're not all going through the same thing, but we're all going through something. And so if we as a church can pray for you, come alongside, support you in any way, we would love that opportunity to do so. So again, they will be here as, as long as need be. Couple things on your way out. Next weekend, we are gonna celebrate baptism next weekend, life change. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing weekend. Uh, we've got one more video from Israel at the Jordan River that we can't wait to, to share with you. If you want to get baptized next week, just let us know. Go to willowcreek.org slash baptism. Let us know. We'd love to celebrate you next week. And then in two weeks, one of our favorite seasons around here is something called Celebration of Hope. And that'll kick off in two weeks from now. Celebration of Hope is a, is a season where we highlight our global partnerships. We have global partners in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, all throughout Latin America. Uh, we can't wait to tell you the stories of what God is doing in all these different places. Uh, it is one of those can't miss experiences. Now, a part of Celebration of Hope, something we've been doing for 10 plus years, is something called seed packs. Uh, we pack a bunch of seeds as a church. We send them to our global partners. Uh, each seed pack will end up producing 1,250 pounds of food that will go to feed families, also generate income for families. It's an, it's an amazing, amazing thing. It's something you want to be a part of. We love to invite you back to be a part of it. So a lot of great things. Uh, uh, stick with us. Uh, we'd love to see you a part of all that God is doing here at Willow. Uh, one last thing before you leave. If you've been around here for a long time, you know we've had some flooding issues and our south entrance has been closed. Our team worked double time to get at least one outbound lane open. So you can take advantage of that. Hopefully that, that serves you today. But Willow Creek, we love you. So grateful to be a part of this Easter celebration with you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.